What's up guys, I'm the Pop Rocker, and today I have something very fun that I want to talk about. For me, anyway. You know what? I'm actually gonna just, just... There we go. For music lovers, your first album is usually something special. It can be a badge of honor, something that defines your taste at an early age. It can be something nostalgic, that first vinyl record that popped your cherry and introduced your love of the art form. It could be something hilarious, an ironic, out of left field guilty pleasure. And seven out of 10 times, it's Dark Side of the Moon. The first album I owned as a music lover was Echo, Silence, Patience, and Grace by the Foo Fighters. And as much as I have outgrown the time when they were my favorite band, that album will always hold a special place in my heart. Every song hits with the memories of being a young teen, laying on my bed, unable to do my homework because I was too distracted by the hypnotic guitar riffs and angsty lyrics. I just, I love knowing that that was my first. But that's not entirely true. That was the first album I bought. Growing up in a musical family like mine, it was impossible to make it 13 years without an album to call my own. And a few years before that, when I was barely scraping double digits, I was given my real first album, AHA! The Singles, 1984 through 2004. A collection of 19 of the band's greatest hits in almost as many years. Not a season has gone by that I haven't found myself drawn back to these songs at least once. They've been a part of my life for as long as I can regularly remember. I've jokingly said before that just knowing these songs by heart makes me a countrywide expert on the band, and at least in my circle of friends, that's kind of true. Most people can't name more than one song by them. In fact, a lot of people can't even associate them with their one known song, despite its massive popularity. Yes, them. The world's greatest one-hit wonders do in fact have at least 18 more songs and a career spanning almost 30 years. We just didn't hear about it over in America. So this past summer, while tipsy and trying to hold out the eight measure note and summer moves on, I had a realization. I'd been listening to this album for 15 years and I'd never thought to explore the songs beyond. I decided I should finally give the band that I've secretly loved for so long the full album experience that they were due and buy one of their records. So I bought all 10 of them. And I felt like that was something that I needed to document. Let me give you all a quick backstory of the band just so you'll start to think of them as more than the pencil art music video guys. AHA is a three-man band from Norway formed in 1993. They had massive success with their first single, Take On Me, but weren't really able to find that success again in America, only having three more songs chart between then and 1993. And because we Americans tend to think the world revolves around us, we considered them a one-hit wonder after this even though they went on to have 36 more songs land on international charts, with the last one happening in 2016. Granted, it only made it to 179 and only charted in France, but the specifics aren't really important here. These guys were huge in Europe, and they're basically national heroes in Norway. As I said before, they released 10 albums in their career, not counting all of their live and compilation albums, because there are a lot of those too. I found that there was one specific moment in the band's career that I could base the whole thing around. Their breakup in 1994. So we start now with our journey through the pre-breakup albums, beginning in 1984 with Hunting High and Low. There's a few albums that I want to take out and look at specifically, including this one. Their debut would set a few trends that became cornerstones of this project, which I'll get to soon. First, though I've already brought it up a few times, but it's impossible to do this album or this band justice without mentioning its opener, Take On Me. Take On Me is a classic, one of the greatest songs of the decade. It's really easy for it to cast such a large shadow over the band's career. And I'm glad that it was the first of the hundred plus songs that I listened to so that I could go ahead and get it out of the way and let the band start to stand on their own. It's like the Batman to AHA's DC. 
You know, no matter how good the rest is gonna be, it's never gonna stand up to the giant that Take On Me is. When I compared the rest of the album to songs that I already knew, like The Sun Always Shines on TV, it held up for the most part. The songs had a consistent tone, the album felt like a complete work, but a few things started to stand out. The songs didn't feel the most cohesive. It felt more like someone was playing the album on shuffle. There was no ebb and flow to the emotions and the tones behind the album. And I think it was most apparent in the last song, Here I Stand and Face the Rain, because it didn't feel like a finale as much as just the last song that happened. Both of these things, the lack of cohesion and the deflating finale, would be things that followed the band through most of their albums, along with poor openers after Take On Me, of course. But there was one more little quirk that I found, something that became a bit of a scavenger hunt for me, you could say. This is Living A Boy's Adventure Tale, a song that is not about going on a Goonie Styles adventure, but is instead about being in love with a woman, which if anything, makes it weirder. This would be the start of what I would simply call the weird songs. And most albums tended to have them. Their songs that would take a hard left on album theme would be full of strange lyrics or would do something like this. Overall, I ended up giving this album a 5 out of 10, with an extra point for having Take On Me. A good, safe entry point for fans of the band. I'm not going to go through all my ratings for every album, but I'll put the rest at the end. The 80s also saw the release of Scoundrel Days and Stay On These Roads, and these albums pretty much stayed on par with what I expected from the first one. This is one of those bands that didn't really change a lot, but didn't disappoint either. And it was in the notes for one of these albums that my vision of the band really started to take shape. AHA feels, a lot of the time, like a lounge band trying to make it in mainstream pop. They give us decent synth pop and evolve their genre a bit with the times, but their connective tissue is always this feeling that they'd rather trade in their synthesizers for residents on a cruise ship. I can't really explain it better than that, you just have to trust me. That being said, neither of these albums failed to deliver on the charm of songs that I would imagine being played in between the popular songs on the radio. Or, more fittingly, the band that your dad would buy you for Christmas if you asked for Duran Duran. Basically what I'm saying is, it's no surprise that they didn't reach the heights they originally did in 1984, but they should have gotten a little more recognition. In the 90s, it was a bit of a different thing. A little about me for anyone who doesn't know. While the 80s are my favorite genre for music, the 90s are my least. After that transition period between the decades, everything kind of fell off for me. So I went into the next album, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, with lowered expectations to say the least. In fact, if you were to judge an album by its cover, this would be the album that I would expect to like the least. So color me surprised when this ended up being my favorite album of the pre-breakup era. It helps that it starts off with Crying in the Rain, which is a top five AHA song for me, but it continues on with almost a new identity. In doing my research for this, I learned that this album was considered a departure into a darker tone for the band, and like, yeah, a little bit. It felt like the pressures to deliver another worldwide hit had started to leave, and the band had settled into their own little corner. They were free to create and express themselves in any way they wanted, ditching some of their synthesizers and programming and replacing it with more guitar-centered sounds. When I heard some of these songs, I realized I had possibly just been tolerating the band before. Songs like Sycamore Leaves and Rolling Thunder gave me hope. Hope that things were looking up for the band as they found themselves. Boy, boy did that come crashing down. 1993 brought Memorial Beach, and just, it's not good. I feel like it's best to start talking about this by just reading my notes while I was listening to it. These guys really don't know how to start their albums. I guess the tone has been consistent. What the heck happened to this band? 
How did they get so bored so fast? I'm starting to forget this is AHA. And finally, this is the first album I regret buying. It highlights the lack of cohesion in the worst way. Not only does it feel like the songs don't go together, it feels like the members don't. Not once does it ever feel like anyone is having any fun recording this album. I can almost picture them in the studio. One records a guitar solo, says, how was that? And the others, not looking up, say, yeah, fine, next, until the album is done. The band has said since that this was a dark time for them, and it probably led to their breakup a year later. From what I've been able to gather, I don't think there was any ill will between the members. I think they all just got tired of doing the same thing repeatedly. After they broke up, they all immediately went and started releasing solo albums, so I think they just needed some time to do their own thing. And it certainly worked. At the turn of the millennium, they came roaring back with Minor Earth, Major Sky. It was like the band had gone into a musical cocoon for seven years. And when they came out, they had finally shed all the expectations of their early career. They could make whatever music they wanted. And the result was basically the same, really. Most of the albums they released post-breakup suffer from the same problems they did before. There isn't really a lot for me to say about the back half of their careers that I haven't said already, but they do feel like they have a more clear vision and identity. Minor Earth gives us that optimistic future sound that a lot of early 2000s music had. Lifelines has a more soothing, polished tone, something that the band had played with before but never really explored. Analog gives a fresh, mature feel to the band's career. Even 2015's Cast in Steel had something to offer by showing that the band could play just as well in the modern musical landscape. But none of these albums really felt like they got to the next level. And while there are a few standout songs spread across them, most of the albums fail to capture the real magic of a complete piece of art. But there is one that stands above the rest. There is one album that does its best to highlight everything the band can be. And that is their magnum opus, Foot of the Mountain. Foot of the Mountain manages to mix the modern flavor the band had taken on perfectly with the nostalgia of the 80s sound they were born into. It felt the least like a chore of any album since Scoundrel Days. It has this special optimism about it while still preserving the dark undertones that the band had picked up. And it features the greatest opening and closing combination of any album in their catalog. All of this comes together to create a work that I put at the top of my list with a solid 7.5. Because at the end of the day, it's still an AHA album. So here I was at the end of this journey, listening to an AHA album a day for a week and a half, and it didn't feel Don't complete. I didn't have a grand finale, climax to it all. Cast in Steel was a minor return for a band that had called it quits and found one last spark, not a proper goodbye. But the band had found a way to say their farewell, an MTV Unplugged session. So I sat down, I bought one last album, and I settled in for what would be an end credit montage as the band slowly faded away from my present day. An acoustic rendition of all of our best moments together. And this is when I finally got to reflect on why I had done this and what I had learned. AHA is a band that landed at the top of the mountain and never again managed to achieve that success. Despite this, they never let it get to them. They never compromised themselves to be someone that MTV probably wanted them to be. They always were and always will be unapologetically AHA. I have listened to every song the band has released, and the only one that doesn't feel like the band is the one they're most known for. We can learn a lot from the lessons that AHA has taught us. You don't always have to be the best, and people don't always have to love you, but some people will. You just keep doing what you do, and the right people will find you and appreciate it. If you stay true to yourself, slowly you'll learn that life is okay.
that's going to do it for today's video. Hopefully I have encouraged you all to explore this band more, but if you don't, I certainly wouldn't blame you. Are there any other bands whose careers you want me to explore like AHA's? Let me know down in the comments. Or you can always find me at any of my socials. Either way, I've been the Pop Rocker, and I'll see you guys in the next video.